Thanks oh, for taking I think you took time, time today to uh, uh, listen to a Faciliflex Express discussion with several experts from AES and a couple of other panelists. And I think if each, each of us would introduce ourselves, and I'm going to uh, move now to the d display of the panelists. Uh, I'm Bob McElvain of the, of the McElvain Company, and we produce a number of uh, publications relative to the clean room industry, in, including the coronavirus and pharmaceutical solutions. And we're very interested to hear about uh, the fast track uh, standardized options that, that, that you've developed here at AES, uh, not only because uh, of the needs for therapies and vaccines uh, to fight COVID, but, but also from the fact that uh, cancer patients and others that contract COVID have uh, very poor outcomes. And so a lot of the other uh, therapies and, and uh, gene, gene uh, and cell therapies that you're developing, uh, that are developed with your uh, fast track uh, projects can possibly save lives of those that contract COVID. And uh, I'd like to ask Barry Garfinkel uh, of Garfinkel Associates to give us a little of his background, uh, which is very extensive in this industry. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, uh, my name is Barry Garfinkel. Um, I have a, a PhD in, in biochemical virology and spent a lot of my career at Merck and Company. At one point, I served as VP of Vaccine Quality for the world, and um, then went and became VP of Vaccine Technology and Engineering. And our mission uh, in that role was to take a lab scale process from our um, uh, research division, and then essentially set up a commercialized process uh, including the unit operations for the process train, designed the facility, started up, and then provide any troubleshooting or efficiencies over time to improve the process. Um, yeah, with all that uh, wealth of knowledge, uh, we're going to be very interested in some of the uh, questions and uh, comments that you have. And now I'd like to turn to the AES people and maybe Mitch Gonzalez, Vice President of Process Technology would introduce himself. Hello, my name is Mitchell Gonzalez. I've been in the biopharmaceutical industry for about 30 years in all forms of operational roles. Uh, I began my career at Amgen for about 16 years in engineering construction, designing and building fast track GMP facilities you know, developing in the early days what was called interstitial space in which uh, AES, I think, has capitalized off of that, that concept. Uh, much of my experience is directly in engineering with technical services, process development, contract manufacturing, um, as well as project management, uh, leading these groups within the, uh, those functions. I've worked for Merck as well in the sterols division. Uh, Novartis Vaccines and Diagnostics, as well as Baxter's and a couple other companies, including a gene therapy company. And I'm happy to be here and contribute. Yes, and a uh, depth of uh, previous experience. I'd like now to turn to Josh Russell, who is, I think, going to uh, take over from here. He's Vice President of Sales and Marketing. But Josh, give us a little bit of your background before you move on. Absolutely, Bob, and uh, thank you. Um, my name is, as Bob had mentioned, Josh Russell. I'm currently the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for AES. Uh, I come from a you 15 know, year background in uh, aseptic uh, manufacturing uh, and, and drug product manufacturing, uh, both from you know, small scale therapeutics to a larger scale uh, bulk biologic manufacturing. And uh, just Excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, this this new um, product that AES is really coming to the market to really alleviate some of the uh, challenges that um, just industry has been having in general as to being able to fast track and to deliver these cutting edge, high quality and life changing therapeutics uh, to the industry. And we call this particular product. Um, our Facilflex Express. And some of the things that uh, you know we, we generally see that we're um, trying to address with this particular product line is a lot of 
just in terms of GMP construction projects have a number of uh, issues related or hurdles that uh, these drug companies are continually trying to wrestle with and overcome. Uh, first and foremost, especially as it relates to many of these COVID vaccines is um, Project Warp Speed. They want to go faster than Warp Speed, really. Uh, they're asking a lot, and obviously the public safety and health is at risk here. So how do we bring um, a generally a protracted capital construction project to market to get these products to um, patients quicker? And so uh, having a set of proven standard facility options is, is obviously a great way to go. Uh, and then obviously in construction, there can oftentimes be uh, hidden costs that uh, really can uh, blow the budget, so to speak, on, on many occasions. Uh, there's a certain amount of funds that are put aside. Uh, when you think you're a very young startup company with a uh, very you know, earth-shattering new type uh, therapeutic, uh, you don't oftentimes have a lot of you know deep pockets to bring those those products to to market and into reality, and so controlling costs, knowing costs, and controlling those uh, budget risks becomes very very critical. Uh, certainly, you when you build a clean room, you want something that stands the test of time, but also um, holds up to the GMP rigors of maintaining the facility and being able to ensure that that drug product that you're developing uh, can be delivered safely to the patient repeatedly, every time. Uh, and then oftentimes, why do these facilities, when the products and the manufacturing uh, technologies that are being employed to produce these products are the same, uh, how do we just not redesign the reel every time, but get away from the custom facility concept and build something that is tried and true and make it repeatable for multiple applications, multiple locations globally, and, and to be able to deploy those very, very efficiently. Uh, certainly unknown outcomes. I mean, there's nothing worse than deploying a ton of capital and, and having a, a, a large amount of risk and not being able to um, basically have the outcomes that are desired up front of the project and so having a more standard solution with known outcomes certainly obfuscates a tremendous amount of those unknown risks uh, for the project. And then lastly, uh, lacking flexibility. And this is really, I think, a unique feature of the AES system and also the standard facility designs is that although they are standard, we have the um, inherent flexibility built into the design, not only from a process architecture standpoint, but because of the construction methods of the, our solution, our AES modular wall panel, we have the ability to uh, adapt the, the uh, standard design as something that might be more amiable to uh, customers' particular process application needs. Okay. Um, when we look at modular clean room systems, we certainly, uh, we like to use the analogy of a Lego building brick. And what we have is we have standard components and assemblies that are prefabricated -confab -pre composite assembly. And the unique thing is that the AES, because of our focus on modular clean rooms for the pharmaceutical, biotech, cell and gene therapy marketplace, regulated industry, that these components are built for the purpose. It's not some general building block that is tried to apply to a clean room uh, operation. It is built for long-term continual manufacturing of drug products and drug substance and other materials in the GMP space. And so we, the, everything is built for purpose. Uh, we like to say our system is n installed, not constructed. So. Uh, that has huge implications, right? We have trained installers that go out into the field and all they do day in and day out is focus on execution speed, getting the clean room up and running and maintaining the uh, construction quality that's needed to turn over a facility quickly and efficiently. It also reduces headcount in the field. And so this is really important kind of in this COVID context today, right? Fewer people that you have 
in the field producing your facility, the less likelihood that you could have a potential outbreak, you know, micro outbreak within your construction teams and all the other trades working together in a small area, uh, the fewer headcount, fewer people equates to broader safety and less risk to schedule delay on your project. And then lastly, um, the systems and capabilities of the modular construction allow um, a ceiling supported system allows us to get the ceiling done first, allow other trades up above for um, process piping, HVAC and duct work, electrical work, data telecom, things that nature to be working up above us while we're working in parallel with them to build out the broader infrastructure below, walls, ceilings, doors, et cetera. And then lastly, um, the, 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 the materials themselves meet the standard needs, uh, both in terms of ASDM, ICC, IBC, to make sure that you have something that ultimately is compliant to codes for building materials, but also is a, a proven safe material for um, operators and personnel interacting with the cleaner in long term. So Mitch, anything you wanted to add as it relates to you know, the modular cleaner systems, maybe the advantages of those particular systems, uh, maybe bury your experience with these particular components? I think it's important to point out that you know these are parallel activities in terms of conventional construction would require uh, site preparation activities and then post that uh, installation or construction of walls and things of that nature. And just want to reemphasize that the second bullet that is field installation versus not constructed. So these parallel activities are a huge benefit, um, but without sacrificing materials, these materials are fit for purpose. So it's just a win-win situation in terms of high quality components, as well as speed and schedule which are imperative. Yeah, this, this is Barry, and I'll add a few things to that if I might. So another advantage is, um, in all likelihood, the COVID exercise is going to require multiple manufacturing facilities by each of these vaccine developers. And it, it's it's uh, a great advantage both in speed and design that one can have multiple uh, clean rooms in which to install the process trains and know that the performance of those HVAC systems um, will be the same as well as the ability to reuse things like SOPs for cleaning and maintenance, et cetera, where one doesn't have to uh, rewrite them specifically for each of the uh, facilities. So again, that, that gives us a lot of advantages for time as well as costs. Yeah, Barry, uh, you know, I want to develop on that a little bit for Barry in terms of the tech transfer package that is required to do these. So that is a really great point, Barry because those tech transfer documents will enable not only through the SOPs, but through the training and the, the startup and the commissioning of not only the facility, but the pre-validation work that happens. So that, that is very critical that those activities can get stacked on top and start being done in parallel using similar staff and transitioning to new staff. I mean, that, that is another big benefit uh, as well. Yeah, Mitch, ahead, you, you also uh, brought up another point, which I'll, I'll speak to also. Normally, uh, the way the FDA through CBER operates um, is the expectation is that the clinical supplies and the process used to manufacture those clinical supplies will be tested in the clinic as they're doing now. And if one were to scale things up, and in essence change the process, the standard practices then we would be required to go in and repeat some of those clinical studies in man. By, by having this type of a uh, facility where we could literally not scale up but scale out into three or four uh, different manufacturing uh, su uh, suites or locations, enables us to potentially utilize biochemical uh, equivalents in our license process and essentially then 
uh, through, through the use of the biochemical comparability, um, as noted by CBER, would then allow us to avoid having to do additional clinical trials. So again, speed and cost would become big factors there. Now, um, Barry, question for you. Uh, in your experience, and, and certainly trying to translate these uh, vaccines to a uh, you know, manufacturing scale, are there instances where you learn more um, after you've kind of quote unquote launched the product and have to make maybe alterations to your manufacturing process, which could influence the way that the existing facility was set up and, and built? Yeah, so um, one of the missions we always had in, in tech ops uh, for vaccines was to, in the future, look for, can we streamline processes? Can we modify processes uh, post-approval, post-licensure, in order to uh, uh, make the vaccine uh, more uh, less costly to manufacture, et cetera? And again, the ability then to, if we had to reconfigure some things or modify the process train, uh, certainly is advantageous to us. And having a modular system enables a lot of that to be done. Mm. An actual yeah, example you know, of, I'm sorry. Go ahead. An actual example of that could be if one were doing upstream processing and originally had one seed train feeding one production, production bioreactor, and then we determined we could actually use the seed train to feed two, we could then add a module on to hold that second bio production bioreactor um, so that we could produce twice as much. Mm. Yeah, it's one of the things that I think is, a, again, going to that speed of execution and the ability to quickly reconfigure a facility really lends itself very nicely to uh, a modular wall panel system. And one of the things that I, I like to think of is, is what dictates the arrangement and configuration of your manufacturing facility. Uh, it, it's always the process, right? It's never the facility is supersedes the process. And the, the thing that's very nice about a modular wall and clean room system is that it easily adapts and changes and morphs to meet the, the process needs that are required. And it, it may be something that's today, or it may be something that's tomorrow, but you always have that kind of ace up your sleeve where something can be reconfigured quickly to um, further enhance your process. Yeah, this is, this is Bob. I wanted to uh, add or ask one more question as well. It seems a lot of the trend on the equipment lends itself to smaller modular systems rather than the old stick belt uh, systems where, for instance, you had one great big fan and a, and a ballroom clean room. Uh, at, in the systems that you're designing, you have multiple fans and multiple uh, distribution systems above uh, above the, uh, in the ceiling. So the modularity uh, is actually an advantage, I think, and even the cost of these multiple fans, surprisingly enough, is, is less than one big fan. Uh, would that be your experience as well? It is. So again, going back to uh, what I shared previously is, is the, the architectural design is, is obviously, from our perspective, influenced by the process. And with these smaller scale um, batches that are being required, it's, it is it's shrinking the equipment. It, it's shrinking the rooms um, that are needed, uh, and therefore um, your facility designs are also becoming uh, much smaller. And then with the advent and, and a really rapid adoption and standardization of single use and close technology, not only does it further reduce the size of the facilities, but it also reduces um, other um, you know, grade requirements for the rooms itself. So you have a, a lower HVAC burden, as you mentioned, Bob. Uh, you have less risk as it results to cross-contamination or containment concerns within the facility, which also are reflective on size, um, HVAC requirements, uh, maybe the quantity of airlocks that are required. 
and uh, it makes a more adaptive, flexible, nimble, and smaller scale facility. And then even when we start, you know, my background is on the fill finish equipment side, you're starting to get many manufacturers today that are making, um, you know, equipment that is, I'll say, uh, you know, less um, fixed and more adaptive to a variety of uh, container format processing options. They have the ability to um, produce maybe syringes and vials on the same production line. And so you sacrifice efficiency of mass scale production for um, adaptability for smaller batches, which is you know exactly where the industry is going for cell and gene therapy type uh, applications. Uh, but you know for for mass scale vaccine production, uh, that's where we see maybe more of your uh, larger ballroom design configuration, especially for these uh, very large high output filling lines where they'll put, um, you know, two or three filling lines in one production ballroom uh, to mass produce um, one given product. Uh, certainly a lot of SOPs and, and uh, documentation and procedural things that have to be taken into account to make sure you don't have uh, any type of product mix up on those lines. But uh, to your point, we definitely see an overall trend going towards smaller, more adaptive, nimble facilities than the larger open ballroom type concepts. And I think it's worthy to, to develop yeah, the, a little bit in terms of the, you know, the word flexibility and what we mean by that. In terms of engineering and construction, we're talking about the engineering portion of it. You know, the, the materials construction are fit for purpose, they're fit for the industry, they're not particle shedding generally in terms of how they're, they're fabricated and put together, but developing a little bit more on the construction portion of the flexibility term. As the facility changes, a, a problem that happens in terms of the amount of dust that's generated from a lot of conventional or traditional type material uses, mostly drywall, which, is, which can be very cost effective up front. Um, but when that happens and starts modifying the facility, the particle generation, as we've all experienced, whether it be in our homes or one of these projects, proliferates everywhere. And that's a nightmare for an existing facility through an intake on an air handler. You just don't want it. So that flexibility in terms of the material, not only from its unit Lego quote unquote type approach, but also from modifying the facility of move, removing unit pieces and modifying rooms, uh, but also from a material and a cleanliness type uh, maintenance and reduction in making those modifications to the facility. It's much more straightforward to requalify the areas as they come back up and the modification has been made. So I just want to kind of stress that point. You know, the other, the other thing, Mitch, that I think may be uh, worthwhile mentioning is also a lot of the materials for COVID are being manufactured by CDMO organizations or CMO organizations. And when, when one looks at the business they're in, uh, time for changeovers in between potential products is very important. And, and in fact, uh, that's why they've gone to a lot of the single use type of equipment. So if you think about the filling line, uh, one of the big things previously was after we utilize that filling line, we had to do an extensive cleanup, often done with a, a clean in place system, et cetera. And it could take us a fair amount of time to turn that room over. However, if we were using single use equipment, we could do far more production campaigns in the same period of time, especially if different products had to be manufactured within the same room. So again, having the ability then to put different process trains within this modularized clean room system could be very advantageous to us from a productivity standpoint. Absolutely agree. So we've already touched on uh, really, I think in this conversation, you know, many of the advantages of, of modular execution, but I think there's really four pillars that really are the focal point, not only of AES and, and our modular system, but really I think for every pharmaceutical company that is looking to produce products, right? The key is that 
ultimately these products and these facilities have to be in compliance with uh, CGMP requirements wherever they go globally. Um, yeah, everybody's looking for a lower, better net present overall value, a quick return on investment. And so the, really to deliver on that and, not only, and also deliver these products to clients, schedule becomes increasingly critical. And then, uh, Mitch, you articulated flexibility very well in your prior comments, so I won't belabor that, but really, how do we deliver, get from point A to point B as quickly as and efficiently as possible, and really be able to um, add on or bolt on new and important capabilities and features to that facility uh, long term. So really capitalize on that investment over the long haul. And then lastly, you know, how can we make the products better and faster? So uh, we, we definitely have a focus at it, yes, with our wall panel construction on durability, longevity, so that, um, you know, you don't want your plant shutting down. I tell people everybody focuses a lot on process equipment, right, because it's what touches their product. But the one thing that I think oftentimes doesn't get it to do credit, but unless it's something's wrong with it, is the room that they're in to produce these products, a clean room, right? It renders everything that you are doing in those, those uh, clean room suites ineffective. You're unable to do it if the clean room is not operating as intended, right? It is the most critical piece of infrastructure, in my opinion, in an entire pharmaceutical facility. So, when we take that in mind, right, it, it architectural system is, or the facility flex approach that AES offers, in our viewpoint of, of a clean room, is that it's an integrated offering, an integrated solution, right? So it's a combination of both the architectural envelope and the mechanical system that get uh, integrated together, right? So I look at the, um, the architectural system as the body, right, and the mechanical system as the soul. It really provides the temperature, cleanliness, um, containment requirements, the humidity and pressurization. And when AES provides that integrated solution, right, it eliminates a tremendous amount of risk from, from the, the client that is engaged with us for this project because AES is willing to stand behind and guarantee performance of those respective elements as are required for, for the application. Mm. So we take that one step further, um, AES is offering uh, three different uh, models of our Facilflex Express um, design. And so we have uh, what I'll call a smaller version, which we, we call our 5K, which is approximately a 5,000 square foot facility that um, takes us from time of purchase order to time of handing the keys over the facility for final validation and qualification, six months. Uh, 15K, which is right around 15,000 square feet of uh, clean room space, eight months. And then our largest offering is our 30K, which is 30,000 square feet of uh, manufacturing space where we can deliver that from start to finish in, in 10 months, okay? And then when you look at uh, the, uh, the amount of flexibility that these really offer, um, you know, you can go from one to multiple processes. And you see within the 15K, it also has a tremendous amount of room for expansion uh, in, that, in that area. And then with the 30K, also has the ability, basically a mirror line to the left or to the right, and be able to um, add a second process uh, to that particular facility design very, very quickly and efficiently. Josh, let me ask you, it's worth, oh, I think it's worth pointing right, out Barry? that these are all developed, these aren't, these aren't theoretical exercises, these are empirical exercises that were generated from data, uh, proven data of, of past projects. So these are typical layouts. That doesn't mean a particular uh, process or client would be perfectly fit into this, but it's pretty close in which we've done a lot of the engineering from the previous slide that Josh had showed on the HVAC. We can back up the performance of these rather than a custom design, which is the traditional way in which the air handlers have to be installed and the rooms have to be started up before the commissioning and qualification can be, even begin. 
the reason that we can support and back that up is because these are fairly fixed designs and their performance. We know within a few percentage points of how they're going to engineering spec wise perform. So we think that we can come, we know that we can come up much faster and that the commissioning qualification documentation can start much earlier in the process and be completed very quickly post uh, completion of the installation of our units. So a couple of questions I had, Josh, maybe you and Mitch can speak to that. One is, is it fair to say then that a lot of the facility engineering work would not have to be done for these or much simpler? And second, if I ordered three of the Express 30s, what would the timeline be to deliver three of them? All great questions Barry. So I'm going to start with your your latter question first and then I'll progress to your first. So if I forget along the way please refresh my memory but uh, yeah it's an excellent question. So for um, each one of these designs we are able to I, I tell people it's not a serial operation so if you bought three it's done in parallel. We're able to basically go straight to permitting uh, for those particular um, designs, right? Let's say, for example, you wanted five or three 5K facilities dotted in three places in the U.S. The expected delivery outcome for each of those options would be, right, not 18 months, adding, doing one after another after another. They'd be done in parallel. Assuming you have, you know, the plot of land selected, maybe the shell building is already there, and we're basically ready to show up on site, understand site conditions very early on, and then we can move straight to um, getting the code officials involved in those localities and uh, get their input, get the permits, and move right into manufacturing and installation of the clean room. Uh, as it relates to the, um, the, the state of design, so to speak, and what is considered, let's say, more or less complete, uh, there's a couple of things that um, are important to know as it relates to site conditions that will influence some of the design. For example, if we were to build uh, one of these facilities in California, uh, there's obviously certain seismic uh, steel design considerations that have to be done, uh, and those are specific to site. So we may have to make uh, some additional alterations to schedule to under, you know, basically incorporate the seismic steel requirements that will uh, support the clean room ceiling. Uh, in addition to what is maybe perhaps the uh, facility has a seal that we can support our cleaners from. Another question that has to be considered is where's the air handling equipment gonna be located? Uh, are we building a structural mezzanine within to support that? Can we put the HVAC equipment maybe out on the ground within the facility? Is it a rooftop unit or some sort of exterior unit? So there's a number of different site condition factors that we have to take into account. Um, but that being said, even with those site conditions um, you know, being developed and determined when we, we show up on site, uh, we, we, we strive very, very hard to get that done within the window, uh, each of these uh, offerings. Um, a guarantee. Any other questions, uh, Barry? Did I answer uh, the questions you asked? No, I think you did. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mitch, I know you and your team uh, really spent a lot of time looking at a, a variety of facility options when we were looking to develop these standard offerings, right? And we looked at, uh, the beauty is that AES will probably design and build more modular clean rooms than anybody else in North America. And so we see a lot of things, a lot of trends in terms of clean room designs that, that people are, are throwing at us every day. What kind of set these three designs apart that drove us to more or less standardize on these configurations? One of the key things that you had mentioned before is the use of single-use technologies. One of the benefits of these designs is that we don't require, that it's not designed into them any of the ancillary functions in terms of 
large water systems and deep pyrogenization and sterilization of components, um, things of that nature that are required of mostly classical biologics, which is very high processing, you know, 200,000 uh, plus vial batches. Uh, these are smaller batches of cell and gene therapy that are yielding, um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of vials. And so that induces between single use of technologies and pre-sterilized components, a lot more flexibility into the design. So that was probably one of the first key aspects of these, uh, these particular designs. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, we took those configurations and put them into certain types of geometries that we saw patterns of, and that's what you're seeing here in terms of how they're running the standard operations on a low production and, and to a great extent, semi-manual type process until some of the automation kind of comes in. And to Barry's earlier point, um, you know, whether you scale up or scale out, uh, these types of designs can do either of those in terms of how the expansion would be done. Obviously scaling out, you would just be replicating the unit type of rooms that have been designed here versus scaling up, you might expand a particular room. But what we did do with the designs to the best of our ability, at least the larger ones, the 15, especially the 30, was to kind of congregate and consolidate the key ancillary type uh, areas that we needed, the gownings and the formulations and the storage to more, more one side of the building so that as the designs expanded, they would simply add more rooms with the support on one side to minimize disruption. We know that there's going to be tech transfer and new processes and products that come into the facility, so they were intended to minimize that disruption um, in terms of doing, which of course you have to submit with your licensing when you have to notify the FDA and you want that as, as least complicated as possible, not only for the operation, but from a filing perspective as well. And that was uh, mm -hmm. thought of as much as possible in these designs. Yeah, one of the things too that I thought uh, you and your team did a really good job on is really understanding um, the, the business side of these customers as well, right? There's obviously there's the technology, there's the process side, but with a lot of our um, clients that we're working with, one is, uh, you know, is this going to work, right? Am I at the end of the day going to be able to have a facility that is going to meet the rigors of um, GMP and the FDA or the EU will buy off on. And in every one of these circumstances, we have these layouts deployed in the field and the FDA has, has uniformly approved um, the plan operations for um, these facilities. And so one, they, they have uh, basically an assurance that the design is compliant, number one, both in terms of materials uh, layout, flows of people and materials throughout the facility. And uh, so that that's a huge driver right there. And number two, uh, the control of costs, right, and budget. So to be able to buy a facility or standard layout with a known <laughs> fixed cost and schedule eliminates a lot of worry for a lot of CEOs, right? They know, hey, I need, I need to deliver a product here at this date. I need to know that it can get done. And I need to know that the costs aren't going to escalate from what I was originally told in my budget because my budget is fixed. I can't go back to the investors and get more money. And so being able to have a solution that get, answers those key questions, I think is, is really going to be helpful to um, you know, facility planners, CEOs, and executives alike trying to understand what the future of their manufacturing capabilities will look like. It really eliminates that risk. Um, yeah, Josh, you bring up a really good point that should be developed on in terms of that, in terms of what these offer is an upfront uh, capital estimate, a good estimate with each one of these. Having lived all of my career my 30 years in the industry on the client side and with the last almost uh, eight months, nine months now with AES, 
I get to sit down and instill that experience, and that has that in these designs. But you raise a very good point. One of the things that we wanted as a client when I was on that side is I need to have a number. I'm going to, through capital appropriations, um, I need to have an idea of that number, and not just the back of a napkin. These represent much more than the back of a napkin. They represent a good estimate, not only in terms of project durations, but also in terms of cost that you can go to your capital appropriations with and pass the red face test, as we call it, with the executive team and you're pitching that. The worst thing that could happen in a capital project for anybody is when they have to go back and say, I missed it by 30%. And it's usually rationalized because you had very little information. But when we go through these, we vet these very clearly with the client of what these represent and what they may not represent in terms of fitting them for the leveraging the opportunities of them. But having those numbers up front in terms of the budget number is a big aspect uh, of these that we offer. Where can you sit down and say, here's the size, here's what it is, and here's how much it costs. Most of the time you have to go through an elaborate conceptual design process that takes months and money before you can arrive at that and then go back to your executive committee and give that money. So that's a big opportunity for this type of approach as well. I had one question relative to the useful standardization as you move from the 5K up through the 15K and 30. And assuming that you have a small batch pilot unit that's successful, and then you move on to the 15K or 30K for the actual production, is there a benefit in the experience that you've had with the design at 5K that uh, you then can ap uh, apply for the production units? It would, it would be in the terms of the scaling process, but not necessarily relative to the processes. It really depends on the unit operations of the process. I've yet to find anything that's identical between processes. There are definitely similarities. It's how much they use single-use technologies, and as well as what the procedures are set up like larger companies like the Mercs, the Pfizer's, the Amgen, they have their standard processes in which there's many ways to do something and they have a particular way in how, how they want to move and do their unit operations. You have to adjust to those. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't leverage those, that understanding of those between each other. But they're not necessarily replicates in terms of the 5, 15, and 30 um, them, in themselves. You know, one of, one of the other uh, things uh, that Mitch had mentioned, which I think is important is, as an example, um, one is that the trend is to go to smaller facilities, perhaps with less uh, capacity. But even that now, with a lot of the single-use bioreactors and a lot of the new technologies has changed, where before to make a therapeutic protein, perhaps we would get a yield of one to two grams per liter, where today uh, it could be eight to 10 grams per liter. So when you have those productivity improvements, uh, what 15 years ago or 10 years ago was a pilot scale can now be used for commercial. So I think, I think that's one thing which is very important. The other is he mentioned on the uh, Express 30K that they kind of, uh, have certain aspects of it, like a gown, the gowning rooms and certain utilities areas, perhaps, which could be leveraged. So if I did need additional um, space, I could add on to that 30K with an additional module, but not have to necessarily uh, also add on another gowning room, et cetera. And I could just leverage that, again, for a potential cost savings and time. and also, Mitch had mentioned, when one has to increase the size of a facility, we're always apprehensive that if I need to continue manufacturing operations, that my construction won't jeopardize the current production facility. And again, this would enable reducing that risk considerably. Great. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a couple slides just because I want to keep track of time here. It's been a really great conversation. Uh, so really quick, I just wanted to 
circle back, Barry, with one of your questions is related to design and, um, and basically timelines. And you can see here that the overall um, time schedule for the upfront effort is really the same. And we have a small window of time in which we can uh, basically handle and address the site-specific um, design requirements or modifications that might be necessary for the uniqueness of the application and the installation location. Go to the township for permitting, get those permits while we are procuring and manufacturing the, um, the respective components, all the while the client is getting the, the building ready for the installation. And then really the change really comes down to Obviously, a smaller building is going to have a, long, a, a shorter duration of building readiness. And you will, because of the amount of square footage of clean room that you're installing and the amount of equipment, and obviously the install goes a bit quicker than the 15K and 30K would. But this gives you a, a real good understanding of how the schedule scales relative to the square foot uh, requirements for the, the facility design. Uh, this is just a real quick illustration as it relates to the scope of work uh, that, that comes with the integrated package. I'm really not going to uh, touch too much on, on this in particular, but it's really an all-inclusive package. It's, it's buying the refrigerator, so to speak, with the, the refrigeration package on it. It's not the architectural envelope, but a completely integrated living and breathing uh, clean room system. So, Josh, come back to look that at, slide again, if you could. Sure. I think it's uh, worthy to sit there and develop. And the fact, I think uh, we've all experienced, Barry, yourself, in terms of what this does, it minimizes the transition points between a project when one company owns the full responsibility. And AES is unique in not only the specification uh, and the compliance aspect of these rooms, um, but also in terms of the transitions between different trades and dealing with the main project team um, as a potential alteration or something like that that may happen. But my point being is, is the real advantage of this is that the mechanical system design, its installation, the room design, all of that is in a central bounded project scope making one company involved. The key is making sure that company is well qualified and capable of uh, maintaining those schedules and has the experience. So th that's something uh, that you're looking at here in this particular slide that gives you a good visual that uh, these types of approaches would own all of that install, the documentation. We even have a commissioning and qualification package that goes on with that because we have those vendors and we get those documentation. So we assemble the package and hand it off to the client and much of that work is already done. They just, you, obviously you can't complete commissioner qualification until the units are installed, but we're able to hand it off to the client who can go ahead and download it into their Maximo, into their CMMS system, in which they can start qualifying that equipment uh, and the process, so minimizing that speed. Yeah, Mitch, and I, I think there's a couple other things that kind of jog my memory a little bit looking at this drawing, too. And that is, a lot of the people today, a lot of the contract manufacturing organizations, et cetera, or people that are new to manufacturing, are kind of looking for a turnkey type system. Uh, and this kind of does provide that very nicely. The other is, the biggest nightmare with a lot of clean rooms is having to do the maintenance on them and having people enter into those clean spaces and potentially then require a cleanup after completion, maybe even requalification of certain aspects of the room. And this type of an installation allows the vast majority of maintenance to be done without having any, anyone enter that clean space directly. And I think, again, that's a, a big advantage today. Absolutely agree. Yeah, and that's actually the huge difference between working with someone who uh, is a design build contractor versus somebody that just comes in to assemble the clean room walls 
and then, you know, dust their hands off and off they go, right? It's someone else's problem to deal with. Where AES, you know, we own the clean room. We own every aspect of ensuring that the clean room that we designed and delivered can be commissioned and operated in a, um, a you know, efficient GMP manner, right? And that's what Mitch's team's focuses on is ensuring that the the flows in, of people and materials and waste and product throughout the facility are done efficiently, and then the architectural system and mechanical systems are sufficient to ensure that they provide a long-lasting, very durable manufacturing environment for the client to be able to produce, uh, you know, their 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 critical products over the long haul, and uh, that's the beauty of it. And then you touched on, you know, just on the maintenance side. Obviously, our key is to design things as maintenance free as certainly possible but uh, AES also has an aftermarket group that is focused on uh, basically providing a, a, a performance assurance of the facility so coming in and doing regular inspections and checkup uh, making sure that it is continually operating at the same it was the day we left right qualify to commission the facility we want to make sure that we support our clients long term in, in, with that asset and so we have a dedicated group of individuals that day in and day out just live and breathe supporting uh, facility operations and maintenance folks uh, with all of AES's cleaners yeah that seems like uh, you you have uh, back on that just one more second on that drawing again you have uh, multiple uh, ducts uh, into your ceiling HEPA modules. Do you not? You know how many? Uh, uh, how much CFM do you normally put in, and how many, how many HEPA modules are there per uh, duct? Because um, I, I, I've seen some of the designs where you have multiple ducts going into the to the ceiling. Yeah, I'll actually bring up a, a, a different diagram. Uh, it kind of showcases one of. Uh, you know, AES's capabilities, uh, this is BIM, right? We can literally design the facility in 3D and you can see kind of the complexity of ductwork. Um, but even with these standard designs, we've worked to um, optimize our trunk runs and our HVAC distribution to the respective suites um, for each room. And so, uh, Bob, it's a, it's a little bit challenging to answer your question directly because um, part of what our team does is they're working with the client to understand what the um, temperature load is. So sometimes uh, respective rooms are driven by a uh, heat load, right? So we're looking at uh, how do we keep the sensible heat within the room at a comfortable level for people interacting with it. So for example, we have a, a number of biosafety cabinets, maybe perhaps some incubators that will put off some heat. Uh, and so that could um, uh, moderate or adjust the amount of CFM that we're providing per room. And then also the grade classification of each space also influences uh, how much CFM and the number of uh, HEPA fan modules uh, that we're, we're including in each space. I see. Those are some of the design considerations that go into um, how we lay out our HEPA filters and the amount of um, HVAC in terms of airflow and supply that we provide to each space. But just without belaboring that point is that there is an advantage then because you have these uh, modular, uh, sub-modular um, sub designs of these uh, that we were just showing here, these HEPA filter module, modules that whether you have the 5K or 15K or, or whatever, you probably have pretty much uh, standard modules there, and there seems to be some advantage uh, uh, from a maintenance standpoint and uh, of, a, of a, a facility having uh, moving from from a smaller unit to a bigger unit, but using some of the same uh, technology. Absolutely, and that's a great point because there is um, commonality between components between the 5K, 15K, and 30K. So there's not, let's say, a, a learning or performance curve that 
have to be overcome from one facility design to another as you scale up. You're right, you have a commonality of components and technologies that are being used. So there's not um, a need to become more familiar with, with something different every time you go from one op option to another. Great point. And that's actually part of the reason why we're able to deliver these facilities so rapidly because uh, there, there is standards in the components uh, and then also uh, one of the things that our architectural designers did is how can we optimize uh, each layout in space with the um, low wall returns, maybe the a number of panels that we have to produce at the factory, right? So that has two tangible effects. One, uh, we can reduce the amount of panels uh, or panel sizes that the factory has to produce. So I want to say, well, why does that matter? Well, you know, you have equipment that has to produce um, these components and panels. Uh, it's less changeover, right? It's very similar to, you know, the analogy to a filling line, right? If I'm going from one product to the next, you know, Barry was talking about the cleaning and the room setup. It's very similar at our factory. We have to change to different dyes, different setups for one panel size versus another. So if we can minimize those types of setups in the factory, we can get um, a, a gain a lot of efficiencies in the factory, get the panels produced quicker, ship them to the site faster. We can carry more inventory because there's less variability on the panel sizes that we're building. So it allows us to reduce costs quite substantially for each facility, but also be able to produce those panels much, much quicker and get them into the field so we can begin construction quicker, right? So that's, that's really the key. Okay. Um, really just, in, in just to, um, you know, keeping time here, the, this is a good example of what the, the 5K looks like. You can see that beyond the materials and process flows, uh, the, our technology team has really looked at what types of technologies are commonly used in, in these type of uh, smaller scale uh, settings. So with the 5K, you can see here, uh, you have three processing suites that are set up with biosafety cabinets, benches, and other equipment to make sure that it's right size for um, the scale of process and the number of people that are interacting and, and operating within these spaces. Um, it really aligns well with accelerated drug product development, you know, your orphan drug type candidates, your breakthrough drugs, uh, cell and gene therapy products. So it's really a nimble and adaptive design. And if we need to scale um, or build out additional processing areas, we can actually uh, continue um, the corridor and build additional processing suites uh, going further south in this 3D model. And uh, it's, it's very nice and nimble. Hey, Josh, I'd like to the, develop on a uh, develop on sure. a point right here on the third uh, the uh, third to last bullet. In terms of aligning with the accelerated development programs, um, it, it's a requirement. One of the key aspects of the agency is the continuation of the continuity of supply. So these aggressive breakthrough type programs are trying to tackle a very difficult supply situation as well as the drug situation. So as part of their program, they do have a design review program. And because these standard designs are kind of fixed, they're ready to submit content to them to the agency to give them comfort and assurance in their application. Not only does your molecule need to be efficacious, whatever design and model that you use, but also the, the supply of product through your validation and your supply approach needs to be demonstrated through some uh, mechanism. And this is also a very key aspect. So this can substantiate that for clients in terms of their supply models and be able to do that. Many companies just say, I'm going to a contract manufacturer and they get that data from them in terms of their layouts and say, okay, that's great. Other ones want to take that much more over their control simply because they can control the quality of the product. They're experts on the process, a process which is not necessarily fixed. Remember, many of these are just on the verge of being validated. There's all kinds of opportunities to improve yield, scale, supply. 
So they need to have it as close as possible. And to be able to do that, they need to assure the agency that these designs and their supply models are going to be robust enough for them to own it. So that's, that's something that needs to be understood as well as the benefits of something more known up front than down the line as far as design and engineering construction. Yeah, great point, Mitch. Great point. Now, if we look at the, the 15K, um, basically, really, the, the layout has your processing suites kind of central to the corridor uh, and the locker rooms and material entry points to the cleaner facility. Uh, here we're showing uh, fill finish suite, uh, you know, fermentation and uh, purification for these respective applications. So uh, it provides a really nice unidirectional personnel and uh, material flow through the facility and really has the ability to scale and bolt on additional uh, capabilities, size and infrastructure uh, if needed for the client over the long haul. We all go on mute for, for just a bit, or whoever's moving around, go on mute. So you can uh, hear a little clearer. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I can stop the recording. Uh, Ross, we're going to have to have two recordings, are we not? <clears throat> uh, if you want to uh, dice this up, edit it into two recordings, that's fine. Uh, but I know uh, I'm not Ross, but you're welcome to. <laughs> no, I it was just, you wanted to go on mute. I was just... Uh, there's a huge amount of background noise that somebody's moving around. That's all I'm indicating. Yeah. Uh, somebody's moving papers and I can't, you can't, you can't hear Josh speak. Yeah. So we probably can continue now to make sure. I don't think we're going to need to uh, delete the recording. I think, you know, this is just a little a blip that Ross can probably uh, eliminate. Uh, so I think that's probably the way to go. Is it not Ross? Yeah. So he'll, he'll take, he'll take out any, uh, uh, any of them, uh, anything that's not, uh, although I think it was all, uh, uh, it could be heard. So we'll, we'll make a decision that later, but yeah, let's continue. Thank you. Perfect. And then lastly, with the, uh, it feels self flex express 30 K it's really an all encompassing commercial manufacturing scale facility. So you see here, um, you know, very large uh, single-use bioreactors, uh, bioreactor trains, so very much a, a large-scale uh, commercial uh, cell and gene therapy type, uh, you know, allogeneic type application or even a uh, biologic type facility for maybe perhaps monoclonal antibody tech, tech, tech products and technologies. And again, designed for um, single-use technology and is really designed for the commercial scale. Um, and uh, three process suites are shown, but as I mentioned earlier in my discussion, has the, a very easy ability to um, double, if not triple, uh, the size and scale of this facility based upon the client's needs and the layout. But it's really the, the inherent beauty of the way that Mitch's technology team has, has laid this out is that although it's um, certainly substantial in size for a commercial drug product. If they want to make a multi-use facility, it's very easy to um, enhance the design to accommodate uh, additional uh, bioreactor trains for a commercial scale uh, with this design. Mitch, anything you wanted to add to, as it relates to the 30K? Uh, no, not at this point in time. I think you covered that well. Great. Well, you know, certainly, Bob, uh, Barry, really, really appreciate, um, you know, the conversation here. Is there any other questions or thoughts that you had as it relates to Faciliflex Express and how it might be further leveraged in industry, given your insights? Um, I think I'd, I'd put something else out there. One of, one of the things which has always been kind of a bottleneck uh, here, one has to have multiple facilities, is in the past, you've always been required to do clinical trials if you have another site manufacturing a product. 
so it's the same. But there is a mechanism now called um, biochemical equivalence, uh, whereby one can show that through a battery of analytical assays that the material produced in factory A in Alabama versus factory B in Pennsylvania is the same. And it carries, it carries the nomenclature of biochemical comparability. And that has been used successfully and avoided uh, potentially um, time-consuming clinical trials, as well as obviously the cost of running those trials. And again, having the ability to have a facility which is the same with the same process train being run enables that type of uh, strategy. So again, very important, especially with a COVID where multiple facilities will be required. I think it's been a very uh, instructive, useful discussion for me, and I'm sure it will be for many of the people in the industry. And I'd, I'd like to thank the AES people for uh, such a good discussion today and hope we can do this again in the future. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you as well to, to, to Bob and the McLevain company. Really so much appreciate you sponsoring and, and putting this on for us. Let's do it again. Bye now. Take Let's care. Do it. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I stopped.